Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to this, our Monday evening. It's all as a question in my mind, what's going to happen on Monday night? And I'm amazed that you even came back. <laughs> but we welcome you all tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior. And I'm excited in my heart about the possibilities of each meeting that God in his wonderful grace will reach out to meet with all of us. I read an interesting account the other day of a young man that applied for a job in the State Department. And uh, he filled in all the necessary forms, sent in his resume of all his credentials. And a, little, a few days later, he received a letter back from the State Department acknowledging his application and saying to him that, well, your resume is full of exaggerations, distortions, half-truths, and lies. Um, but the letter went on to say, would you be able to start on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> we just got two nights left, and let's be much in prayer that God would use these two nights to lay hold of each one of us in a special way would encourage you to plan to be with us and let's look to the Lord for a wonderful and glorious climactic end. As Pastor Joe has already mentioned, we do have some CDs at the back there. I'm happy to tell you they're not of my singing, but rather of my preaching. If I, I did offer to sing once and they suggested I sing on a hill far away. <laughs> but... Um, uh, the, the proceeds from these go back into our program of world evangelism. As many of you know, we're involved in a worldwide ministry of reaching out to the parts of the world where people have never heard of the name of Jesus. I'll be going out to Cambodia uh, in June. I've been there a few times before. This country has known much grief thanks to the wars and the many that were slaughtered. But there's a church that would not die in Cambodia. It's not big, but there are people that love Jesus, wanting to reach out into the areas that have been so forgotten. would appreciate your prayers as we go out there. And then across to Peru and Brazil, and back to Africa. Uh, the fields are white unto harvest, and, but the, the laborers are few. And we need all the prayers we can get. And we send out a newsletter we also send out a, a, a bulletin of, uh, each month that is called Equipping Evangelists. It's free of charge, just different courses on evangelism. And if you're interested in getting that, there's a place where you can sign up, but you need to put a cross next to it so we know you want that particular bulletin on for evangelists. And we'd love to include you in that. Tonight, I want us to look at a very important word here tonight. I'm going to call it a nation on a time bomb. Because you see, friends, we are new, moving into a new phase of world history. And as one looks around and looks at the newscasts and sees what, or hears what's happening, one realize, realizes that time is no longer on our side. We are living in critical days. But God's word always has something relevant to say to the hour in which we live. And I would invite you tonight to turn with me to the book of Esther in the Old Testament. Now if you're looking for Esther, get to the book of Psalms and turn left. <laughs> and go down the road. And you'll find this amazing book. There's no reference to God in the book of Esther, but God in his sovereignty is everywhere. And God takes a particular interest in what's happening in that day and age. We're going to look at chapter 4, 
And it's then from chapter 5 and also a few verses from chapter 6. Uh, Esther chapter 4, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and to take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Atach, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she, and, she told, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. She had no idea that the nation was sitting on a time bomb. She had no idea how late the hour was. <clears throat> so Atach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate. And Mordecai had told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Sushan that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. So Atak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Atak, gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this, those words in verses 13 and 14 appeared on the front page of the Jerusalem Post some years ago when Israel was in serious conflict. And they were addressed to President Jimmy Carter for an intervention for what was happening in the Middle East. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house. And so it was when the king saw Esther, Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. 
Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. The king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, up to half the kingdom. So Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for them. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And at the banquet of wine, in the, the king said to Esther, What is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Now chapter 6. That night, that's the night between the two banquets, the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bichthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Then the king's servant said to him, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. Just so far, keep your Bibles open as we refer to this amazing story and allow the Holy Spirit to interpret its truths to us. Shall we bow for just a brief moment in prayer? Our God and our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your help, for your protection, for your direction, that you guided our footsteps to be in the place of worship here tonight. And we pray that the worship that we render shall be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. We pray that you will grant your blessing upon your word as it goes forth. We thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. And we pray that it will dispel the darkness so that we might know what it means to enjoy the presence of the one who is the light of the world. We pray for every kind of need represented here tonight. You all know that just as our faces differ, so do our needs the issues with which we wrestle, the problems we face, the decisions we have to make. And we come before you tonight to seek your face and, face and to trust you that in terms of your promises that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so grant that as we consider your word, we will see and behold wondrous things out of your word tonight. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The story of Esther is one of the most interesting and exciting dramas of the Old Testament. I'm sure many of us saw that movie called One Night with the King. How many saw that? Quite an interesting movie. If you didn't understand the book of Esther, you would never have understood that book, that full movie, even though it was a brilliant production. But this story here is about a young girl, a young Hebrew girl. She had won the Miss Universe beauty pageant and found herself within the palace of Persia. It's a thrilling drama. It's a story of romance and passion, 
of intrigue and insurrection, of murder and assassination, coup d'etats and ethnic violence, and the amazing courage of a young Hebrew girl who in the hour of national crisis fulfilled an appointment with destiny. She had no idea what her role would be. She wasn't equipped for the challenge of the hour. For at that particular moment and time for which she was born, Esther would become the instrument that God would use to reverse the curse of the day, to change the course of history, and to interrupt the most wicked plan imaginable for the mass extermination of the entire Hebrew race. What happened here by way of background is that they were living, they were captives in Persia. Now Persia's name was changed in 1935 to Iran. And so Iran has that kind of background. And the king of Persia, or Iran at that time, had what you call an expansion policy. In his lust for power, they would march their troops out and conquer one country after another. Right from one side to the edges of Africa, across to India, as we know it today. One country after another were attacked, were conquered. And as testimonies of their conquests, they would bring back thousands of slaves from all these conquered territories. And they would live and work in the great slave camps of Persia. And amongst the many that had been captured were the people of God, the people of Israel. And Esther found herself within these slave camps, the people that were now being used as well as abused. In their lust for power, the king expanded his empire and used mortal beings as his tools. But then the Bible tells us that something happened in the course of the history of the day. A decree was issued in the highest courts of the land. A decree that was, e, was hatched out of hell. It was designed to destroy the people of God. In his total ignorance, the king signs the decree, signs the death warrant that would wipe out his own family. Little did he realize what he was doing. Drunk with power, the king issues this kind of decree for the mass extermination of the entire Jewish race. The country finds itself sitting on a time bomb, with time standing as the only conscientious objector for that dreadful moment when Hebrew blood would flow through the streets and the cities and the towns of Persia. There seemed to be no human solution, nothing to interrupt it, except for one factor. There was a God in heaven that was one step ahead of the politicians of the day and was prepared to intervene while the country found itself sitting on a time bomb. As we look at this drama tonight, we want to recognize some of the personalities, some of the people that play in the drama. Each one has a significant role. Each one has a symbolic role. Now, I don't usually preach from symbolism because you can arrive at some incredible conclusions. But um, I see a symbolism here that is consistent all the way through and legitimate. And so we want to put this in before us tonight. The first person that I want to introduce to you is this young virgin bride by the name of Esther. What a beautiful young lady she is. There are a number of things about Esther that I want you to understand and then I want us to identify her, to recognize her role. 
to understand the symbolism as we put the whole thing together. The first thing we notice, friends, is that Esther was an alien. She did not belong to that kingdom. She belonged to another kingdom, and she finds herself in a strange kingdom that she's passing through. The second thing we notice about Esther is that she is a captive girl. She is now in slavery, and as a slave, you had no rights, you had no freedoms, you had no choices. You lived as a result of your slavery in abject poverty. But then we notice that she was also an orphan girl. We don't know, quite know what happened to her parents. They could have, been, died, they could have died in the wars or natural causes. But she finds herself alone, an orphan girl in captivity in a foreign land. Not much hope for a person like that. Not much future. As she was living now, hoping just to survive, little did she know the strategic role that she would be called upon to play in the history of her nation. But then as you read on in the earlier chapters, you find that she was also an adopted girl. Somebody saw her in her need, recognized her plight, and adopted her into their family. As a result of that adoption procedure, she becomes the bride to the king. She becomes a different person. But more than that, she becomes a person of influence that would be the person who would redeem her people as she interceded, as she stood in the place where she ought to be, as she took the risk of faith. She fulfilled an appointment with destiny. We were Esther here. Who would you think Esther represents? What would you see, see her, recognize her symbolic value to be? Who are the people who are in this world but belong to another kingdom? Who are the people that once were slaves, were captives, but then have become free? Who were once unwanted and unloved, orphans, then were adopted into an incredible family and by virtue of that adoption have been called out to play the most significant role in all the world and have become the bride of the king. Who would you like, would you like an Esther to represent? I, don't sit there like the frozen chosen. <laughs> Who do you think Esther represents? The Baptist, of course, no. <laughs> huh? Who does she represent? The Christian. The Christian, friends, finds himself in this world, but he doesn't belong to this kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. You want this world, you can have it. It's passing away, by the way. It's rotting by the day. It's dying. Who are the people, friends, that are here, but we're just passing through? We were once slaves. We were once unloved and unwanted. But then one day we were adopted into the family of God. And by virtue of that adoption, we have a new role to play. We become the bride to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Someone else, give us a hand here. Yeah. <laughs> the Christian is in this world, but friends, we're not here just to weigh our anchors. We are here, we're just passing through. We have a role to play. And although we are destined for the throne 
and destined to be the bride of the king. Let me remind you, friends, that all that has come our way by way of redemption, by way of adoption, by way of being in the family of God is for one purpose only, to fulfill a divine purpose here on planet Earth. He never created us to be passengers. He never created us to be spectators. He redeemed us to fulfill a divine imperative down here on planet Earth. And the worst thing you can do is to claim to be a Christian, but you've missed God's will, and your life is barren and fruitless, and you've missed the very purpose for which you were redeemed. And so Esther represents the child of God. She goes through different conflicts. She goes through different challenges, as we all do. She has a role to play that she cannot run from. And neither can we. The nation is on a time bomb. And the most significant people, friends, is the Church of Jesus Christ. President Reagan made that statement when he said, the church is the alternative to what's going on. In spite of all the political parties, in spite of all that men are doing and scientists are creating friends, in spite of all the challenges of the day, God has chosen his Esthers to fulfill the most significant role in all of history. And we cannot be asleep. We cannot be ignorant. We cannot be indifferent, friends. The hour has come when every Christian is called to stand up and be counted. But then we've got another interesting personality which we'll bring up to the platform and seek to recognize his role in the drama and where he fits into it all. His name is Mordecai. What do we learn from the life of Mordecai? In chapter 2 and verse 7, it was Mordecai that adopted Esther into his family. He looked into that little face Beyond the tears and the shame and the sorrow, he saw her absolute her, her uselessness. And he adopts her even though there was nothing she, she, she could contribute. He takes her into his family and gives to her a chance to live. Mordecai, what a role. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, he would speak into her life. Every day he had an appointment with her to guide her, to lead her, to tell her what to say and what not to say. And so Mordecai is fulfilling a unique role of guiding and counseling the life of young Esther. In chapter 2, verse 21 and 23, through to 23, there's an interesting attempted assassination within the palace. No one knew about the conspiracy, but evil men were active, anti the politicians of the day, and they attempted to assassinate the king. But Mordecai became aware of what was going on. And Mordecai exposed the plot of the enemy and have them executed, and spared the life of the king. We'll come back to that a little later. But in other words, whenever Mordecai went, he exposed the evil of the day, the evil conspiracies of the day that most people are totally blind to. Then we find that <coughs> he rejected the authority of Haman. You see, when old Haman would go strutting down the main drag, Everybody fell down and worshipped him. He expected this, but not Mordecai. Mordecai was under another authority, you see. He bowed to no one. And as a result of him refusing worship to, to Haman, he signed the death warrant for all the people of God. This was a representation of the people of God as he refused to worship Haman. But then you'll notice it was Mordecai who came to Esther when she was in the comforts of the palace and explained something that she needed to know that she was totally ignorant of. 
He awakened her from her slumbers to tell her that her nation was sitting on a time bomb. She had no idea, idea what was going on. He warns her there's an enemy in your life, Esther. You have a role to play, Esther. You can't remain neutral anymore, Esther. You can't remain indifferent, Esther. And he wakens Esther to her responsibility that she would have to face in this hour of national crisis. Who would you think Mordecai represents? Right. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who adopts us into the family of God. He sees us lost, miserable, unwanted, rejected, and he adopts us into the family. And he gives us a chance to live. He gives us a new identity in life. It's the Holy Spirit, friends, that daily cares for our lives. Because he realizes that our lives are not our own anymore. We belong to him. We're his property. And he wants to counsel us. He wants to guide us. He wants to influence us. And to keep us going through the various minefields of human experience. It's the Holy Spirit that exposes the enemy's plots. You see, if he were not in this world, I don't think we'd even be here tonight. We'd be doomed. Wicked men are conspiring things day by day. And if they have their way, the first thing they would do is destroy God's people. Our heavenly Mordecai is there to reveal what's happening. It's our Mordi, it's Mordecai. Our heavenly Mordecai that rejects every other authority because he's under the supreme sovereign authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But then it is the Holy Spirit, Mordecai, our heavenly Mordecai, that comes to you and to me and sometimes makes us uncomfortable. He shakes us out of our comfort zones and spiritual bomb shelters. He takes us from where we are and says, hey, you've got an enemy that's out to slaughter you and destroy your family and destroy every value you've got. You have a responsibility. You can't remain the same anymore, Esther. You can't remain passing it on to others more educated and qualified. Esther, you have been saved for this moment in time for a divine purpose and you cannot, and you cannot abscond yourself. Too much is at stake, Esther. The work of our heavenly Mordecai. So we've got Esther representing the Christian, you and me. We've got our heavenly Mordecai representing the work of the Holy Spirit. Thank God he's active. Don't be afraid when he comes and stirs up your nest. Don't be afraid when he comes and shakes us. He's there to awaken us. Why? He's preparing us to be the bride of the King. There's everything at stake. Every Christian, friends, needs to have a fresh encounter with our heavenly Mordecai. Then we've got another character. Well, we'll keep these two guys here. And I think he's pretty obvious. It's Haman. Well, look at this guy. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he is exalted above the princes. He's gone crazy after political power. And he won't rest until he's in the saddle of power. And once he's there, wicked schemes have been hatched out of hell are now planted into his heart. In chapter 3 and verse 10, we find that the king does something rather remarkable. He takes the ring of his finger and he puts it onto the finger of Haman and once Haman got that transfer of executive power the man went berserk he was just waiting for that moment you know why friends he had an entire history of a family tree friends that lived in total opposition and hatred towards the people of God 
And the first thing he wanted to do was to deceive the king to pass a law that would eliminate the entire Hebrew race. He hated them because of their God. He had a history of hatred towards them. And he was happy to swing the politics of the day to wipe them out. And then we find that he deceives the king. He devises this evil plan. He, makes it, he puts a smoke screen around it. He makes it look like just a racial issue. But more than that, friends, he says in chapter 3 and verse 9, if you will get rid of these people, I will pay the bill. And the king just signs. In verse 11, the king ended up paying the bill. Isn't he smart? Deceived at the highest level. The plan now was that on a certain day the acts of hatred would fall upon the people of God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the hour we're living in, by the way. They are the Hamans. And that's obvious who Haman is, isn't it? Who's Haman? He's Satan. Today you don't talk about that, you talk about it in other kinds of terms, but I want to tell you, he is rampant. And he uses the policy of deception. And he gets into the political power seats. And he sits in the saddle of power. And he gets laws passed by, which are supposed to be in the interest of the nation. But actually he deceives. Because that's been his method from the dawn of history to the final climax of history. And the fools of mankind who don't know the truth will find themselves led by their noses to the slaughterhouse. My friends, it's time to come to terms with what we believe because we live from what we believe. We find that the king has no idea what he's even doing. And the politics of the day has now fallen to the depths of degradation. And the nation is sitting on a time bomb. And nobody, and nobody is doing anything about it. Except for one factor, Mordecai is one step ahead. Now, there's one more personality and we'll introduce him in a moment. But let's put it together at this stage. Esther represents the Christian. She has been blessed. She's in the lap of luxury. She's enjoying all the benefits and the blessings of the palace. Everything is going her way. What should she worry about? A young married woman with a bright future ahead of her? Mordecai is one step ahead and he's been speaking into her life, but now he has to get serious with her. She has to understand some things that she just didn't realize. That's why she asked what's going on. Haman has got the country where he wants. He's got the leaders backing him. He's got the law behind him. And there seems to be no way out. But let's take a look at Esther for a moment before we try and put this thing together. Haman has done his deed. Mordecai has sent the message to Esther. Don't think you'll escape, Esther. I'll find someone else, but you'll not escape. In other words, Esther, don't sit there passing the buck. You've got a role to play. Now, Here's the problem. Esther has no idea. Now, why has Esther got no idea? It could have been a number of factors. It could have been the comforts of the palace. But there was one very important thing. Because what was going on, Esther had lost contact with Mordecai. Mordecai used to speak into her life, but now because of the developments that were taking place and she's up there in the palace, they've lost contact. She's not hearing his voice anymore. 
and she plunges into ignorance. And the time has come for Esther to wake up. There's too much at stake, Esther. She's caught now in the crossfire, whether she realizes it or not. Her commitment is on trial now. Her life is being evaluated as she withdraws for three days and three nights to consider everything. He's called her to go to the king. It's against the law of the nation to do that. But you see, friends, he was placing Esther now under another law. It's the law of God, and it can cost you your life. For three days and three nights she withdraws, and she thinks, she prays, she evaluates everything. And the Bible says that she came to that point when she crossed a line and said, if I perish, I perish. I will go through with this and face the king. My friends, for too long we've been on this side of the line. For too long we've been fast asleep. And there comes a time when our heavenly Mordecai shakes us out of our sleep and we have to cross a point of no return. The days of playing church are over. The days, friends, of having some kind of superficial experience of God are over, friends, because we're still in that category. All hell is against us. The nation is on a time bomb. Somebody has to step in the gap. Your family is at stake. Your nation is at stake. We are the Esthers today, friends. There is no other human solution. God is calling, I believe, the church in this nation as well as in mine to a level of commitment we've never known before. Never known before. And I want to ask you tonight, are you prepared for that? Would you cross that line tonight and say, God, I know I'm your child. I've been adopted into your family. I've been fast asleep. I'm prepared to cross that line and intercede. If I perish, I perish, but I'll go through with you. Notice something interesting here, if I may just introduce it as well. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 1, it was on the third day that she stepped across the line. Can you think of someone else who crossed that line on the third day, friends? He had to do it because he loved us so much, because there was no other human solution or hell had engulfed us. All hell had doomed us, but there was someone who crossed that line on the third day and conquered your worst enemy. And tonight he calls you to cross that line. You can sit there and say, that's fine for others, but not me. But don't think you'll escape, according to the word here. Which brings us to the final personality. Esther representing the Christian going through the challenges. Mordecai. Speaking now, Haman, supremely in control, and all Esther has, she gets, she's got nothing else in her hand, no weapon. All she has is the word of Mordecai. She builds her life, her future, everything on the word that's been put into her hand. That's all we got, by the way, friends. You can trust nothing or nobody in this world. You could wake up tomorrow morning and you're bankrupt. You say, that's impossible in America, don't they? I wouldn't say that. I remember some years ago, I was down in Brazil with another evangelist and we were walking on the Coca Cabana Beach. And uh, all of a sudden, it was early one morning, there was money lying all over the place. Well, you've never seen two evangelists dive. <laughs> We grabbed every coin we could find, everything we could find, stuffed our pockets straight to the banks to change for dollars. And the banker said, forget it, they changed the currency last night. <laughs> it can happen overnight. That's right. you see? And then, 
What do we do when that God's forsaken us? We've neglected the true God and sold our souls for the sake of an almighty dollar. Where do we go? The Bible says, prepare to meet your God. What is your God tonight? We're going to meet him. The gods of this world have got nothing to offer us. They have deceived us for years. And like fools, we have followed and walked their way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. Here's the king now. Look at him. In chapter 6. That night, the king could not sleep. This is the night in between the two banquets. The old boy couldn't sleep. He's counting his sheep. But if you don't know the shepherd, you can't sleep. He's a worried man. Why is he sleepless? After all, he's got the power of the entire empire at his disposal. Everything has gone his way. Why can't he sleep? Listen carefully. Esther has his heart, but Haman has his head. If you talk about a situation to get yourself in, where one part of you wants to walk with Esther and with the body of Christ, but the Hamans of the day have got your head and your mind and you're torn between these diametrically opposed forces in your life. And for a while the king could live like that. After all, he was the king. But you see that division begins to grow tighter and he can't go on much longer. And he's starting to sleep. sleep he's sleepless. He's a worried man. Something has gone wrong. Something has snapped. You see, you can't walk that tightrope anymore, my friend. Walking with Esther, walking with Haman. At night you're with Esther. At day we, you're with Haman. And you're being pulled apart by these dividing influences you've allowed to take hold of your life. While he is lying there, They decide to try and pacify the old boy by bringing the records of what's happened in his kingdom rule. Do you know what they read? They read about the time when there was that assassination attempt. When there were those that were wanting to assassinate him and rob him of the kingdom. He had no idea. But there was somebody that exposed the plot of those assassins. Who was it? Mordecai. Not Haman. Haman probably arranged it. Mordecai had exposed it. And they opened the books. The records are being kept by the way of what's happening. And what's happened in your life. The records had to be read. And as they read it, he suddenly discovers that he is alive today, thanks to Mordecai. Everything he has is thanks to Mordecai. The very breath he's breathing, the crown on his head, the jewels that he's got, everything is thanks to Mordecai. And so he asks the question, if that's what he has done for me, what have I done for him? In what way have I honored the one that spared my life and kept me from being dead meat? Do you know what the answer was? You've done nothing, king. Nothing. You've taken it. You've taken it for granted. When you owe everything to the one that spared your life. Haven't we done just that? When last did you honor God? Everything you've got is thanks to his mercy. We should have been dead meat long ago. We breathe in tonight because the God in heaven says, I've got a plan for your life. I've spared you. I've prospered you. But you've never turned around. You've just taken and taken from God your protection, everything you have. I've never honored God. I've been too proud for that kind of thing. 
king. You can't live like that. Well, look what happens. Esther exposes the whole plot. I can just imagine it couldn't have been easy. She's got to stand here before her worst enemy, before the one who could give one signal and her head would roll. And she has to declare truth. But do you know it was the declaration of truth that set the people free? Truth will set you free. But as long as you're not living in truth, friends, we'll never be free. And so the king now has to make a decision. He's been confronted with truth. What do I do? And someone says, down the road, there's a gallows. And the gallows were designed to hang Haman and silence, uh, hang Mordecai and silence his voice so that he'll never disturb you again. You decide, king, who's going to hang. You can't have Haman and Mordecai in your life anymore. You silence the one and release the other. Who will hang? And he makes his decision. And Haman has to hang. You know what's happening in people's lives? We've got ourselves so lost in our own little world that there's a Haman dictating your lifestyle. He'll use pornography, he'll use drugs, he'll use alcohol, he'll use anything he can to hook onto your life and destroy you and your family. You'll never get free until you hang the Haman in your life. No one can do it for you. Who will hang tonight? Will you silence the voice of Mordecai? You're free to go and do as you like and live as you like and die as you like. But you can't have the two dictating your lifestyle anymore. And the moment he hanged Haman, Mordecai, the voice of Mordecai could now be heard. A new day began to dawn. And so the king now hangs Haman. Then he does something else. He takes the ring off the dead man's finger. All the power he had transferred to him. And he takes that ring and he puts it onto the finger of Mordecai. In other words, the same commitment I made to Haman, I'm making now to Mordecai. You transfer the ring there, the authority over your life. And then he makes another discovery. He finds that Haman, is, if, you, if you read in chapter 8, sorry, chapter 9, verse 13, he has 10 other sons running around the show. What do I do with those offshoots of Haman that keep appearing on the horizon? He hangs them. You see, friends, listen to this. Radical disease calls for radical surgery. There's no half measures. I think the significance of the story is obvious. It's recorded long ago, but it's very relevant to the hour in which we live. The Ahamans, wicked forces are loose. Things are happening beyond our understanding. We don't know who to trust, who to vote for. But I want to tell you tonight, God is one step ahead of all that's happening. If it wasn't for the fact we could close church, tear your Bibles up. But it's going to mean everything. It's going to mean, friends, we're going to have to come like Esther of old and cross that point of no return. There's a line you've got to cross, my friend, in which you put your life in the hands of your heavenly Mordecai and all you have is his word, nothing else. An act of obedience and act, friends, of self-denial. If I perish, I perish. I'm going to be the one that's interceding in my home, in my family, in my church, in my country. Where are the Esthers? 
Then there are those who've got no idea what's going on. A choice between Mordecai and Haman. You have to hang the one at the expense of the other. And if I could beg of you tonight, don't silence the voice of Mordecai. It's the worst thing you'll ever do. Hang your Haman. That's breaking your home and breaking your life. And say, God, I'm prepared to hang every trace and the same kind of commitment I gave to the world, the flesh and the devil, I'm giving to my heavenly Mordecai. Will you do that, my friend? We're sitting on a time bomb. And time is no longer on our side. Evil forces are loose. And my question is, we are the Esthers. We are the Esthers. Would you say tonight, God, I'm prepared to cross that line to be an Esther? Is there someone here tonight that will say, I'm prepared to hang that Haman in my life? I've covered it for so long. I've camouflaged him, but my ear is literally throttling my life. Hang him tonight and go free. Everything is at stake. And as we respond to his voice, we find that the city began to rejoice. A new day was born. These are important days. Step across that line tonight. Hang your Haman. And let God have his way. Why don't we bow in a moment of prayer as we think and ponder over what we've heard tonight.